This episode was sponsored by Girls Can Crate, a subscription box inspiring girls to believe that they can be and do anything. Real women make the best heroes, and every month they deliver them to your front door. Hi, Olivia. Hi, Katie. Listen, and I will give you a clue about today's subject. Ooh. Train! A railroad story. Yay! A railroad story that centers on the railroad story, <gasps> in America at least. The, the Transcontinental, Transcontinental Railroad! railroad. <laughs> yes! <laughs> <laughs> the connection for the first time of East and West Coast in America. Yeah! The legendary moment, it was May 10th, 1869. And its 150th anniversary is coming up in a couple weeks. Oh, cool. Oh, boy, the nation is getting ready. (laughs) There's going to be a huge event. And railroad enthusiasts from all over the world are planning trips to be present for the reenactment on site and all of the train related festivities that are happening in tandem with this cool so by your house it is indeed i live here where it happened (laughs) this is this is my hometown Ogden, Utah. Yay! All right, I'm coming. I am flying out and going to this. Yes. It is going to be huge and so exciting. So I think it's a great time to look a bit closer at the story of the Transcontinental Railroad. Cool. It is, of course, an overwhelmingly masculine story, right? All the major players were men from start to finish. U.S. presidents railroad tycoons, even, you know, the Indian warriors resisting it, and the railroad workers. Exactly. Thousands of people worked for the railroad. It took six years to build from start to finish. So it's kind of this this huge moment. And then when it was over, it was over. Hmm. And by 1948, there was one person still alive who had been present at the golden spike ceremony the moment when the rail lines met in 1869 just one survivor wow and it was a woman (gasps) awesome (laughs) her name was mary peterson ipsen and she was the last survivor because she had worked for the union pacific railroad at age 12 what she she was a cook's helper (laughs) wow she was Not at all your classic railroad employee. (laughs) She was a Mormon girl from a remote farm who went to work for Jack Casement's crew, the most notoriously wild and worldly of all. Whoa. Uh, The term hell on wheels, you know, now it encapsulates the American railroad story. But Jack Casement himself coined the phrase hell on wheels to describe his crew. (laughs) (laughs) That sounds like a great environment for a 12 year old girl. (laughs) Exactly. His crew, I mean, and all the railroad employees, they were moving cities full of all the most infamous vices. Uh (laughs) So let's zoom in on this sweet little cook's helper (laughs) and see what happens. Wow. I'm Katie Nelson. And I'm Olivia Mickle. And this is What's Her Name? Fascinating women you've never heard of. So it's tricky to unearth the stories of women on the early railroad. Yeah. So for that, I turned to two scholars who both work in local Utah history. Hi, I'm Holly Andrew. I'm the museum manager at down at Union Station in Ogden. And I am Sarah Singh, and I am the head of special collections at Weber State University. So what can we know about little Mary Peterson Ibsen? Here's Sarah Singh. Yeah, and that is the question, is what can be known about her? Um, She was an interesting woman because she was what they deem a, you know, pioneer into Utah. And so the daughters of the Utah pioneers had said they had a file on her. So I went down there to look at the file, and it was literally one page. 
on her. That was it. And I was like, oh, great. This is no more information that I already found. She represents 19th century America in the big picture, I think. Because for me, one of the major themes of America in the 1800s is immigration. We are an immigrant nation. And in the 1800s, people were coming here from everywhere. (laughs) They were driven by the hope, the dream that America really was the land of opportunity, you know? Mm -hmm. Mary Peterson and her parents, they were some of those arriving by boat from Europe landing in New York City and Boston, stepping off the boat into a new world. Mary Peterson um, was actually born in Denmark in 1857, and she and her family converted to the LDS Church, and they immigrated here to the United States when Mary was just two. But all these immigrants didn't usually find their big chance on the East Coast Mm -hmm. in those overcrowded cities. Right. They had to travel farther still for opportunity, as Mark Twain said. Uh, (laughs) What was it he said? Go west, young man. Right. (laughs) And so they did. Uh, First by wagon, sometimes by handcart, by whatever they had. They just kept moving west till they found their chance. But soon, a huge new project emerged, promising westward expansion in a whole new way. The railroad. Right. It was coming to carry travelers in search of a chance into new lands. But more importantly, it was hiring. It could offer horrible conditions, super low pay, and miserably hard work. Yeah. But there were no rules about who you were or where you came from. Hmm. So they signed up. (laughs) The story of the Transcontinental Railroad is the story of immigrant misfits. It was built by the hard labor of people who had one chance, and they took it. Now, the railroad was slow going, and it was too late for the first wave of Mormons, who wanted to join Brigham Young, their prophet, and his followers in their enclave, which they had kind of built apart from the world in Utah territory. Right. So, they walked. Hmm. And they came across the plains with all the other Mormon pioneers. And um, they arrived in Utah in 1867. And Mary and her parents joined the Mormons in what they called Zion, which at the time was a very different world. (laughs) Brigham Young did things like create a Mormon alphabet. Wow. They shared possessions. Right. We'd probably call it a commune today. And they practiced polygamy, of course. Mm -hmm. And Brigham Young personally had absolute control over who lived where and why and and even what they did. Mm. And then her father purchased land um, up in Bear River City, which is out in the middle of pretty much nowhere, (laughs) Box Elder County. Um, And he became a farmer. So people who came to Utah Territory came to leave the world behind and build a a godly community in the middle of nowhere. But for Mary and her mother, things didn't quite go as planned. Now, the sad thing is, is so there was Mary and she had an older brother and two younger siblings, plus than her parents. When they moved up to Bear River City within a year, both her father and oldest sibling had passed away. So then her mom is left, you know, as a widow with three young children. And so this is 1868. So her mom, who was Christine Nesson Peterson, decided to become a cook for the Union Pacific. Because at that time, uh, the Union Pacific had crossed into Utah and were building the tracks for the Transcontinental Railroad. 
Um, and so the interesting thing I found out was they actually worked for Jack Caseman's crew. So I love to imagine this. A Mormon <laughs> girl, 12 years old. All she's ever known is her isolated godly community. Yeah. <laughs> leaves her enclave, and she rejoins the world in, of all places, <laughs> the most hellish of all Hell on Wheels towns. Wow. <laughs> Jack Casement, he was larger than life, man. Here's Holly Andrew. So Jack Casement um, was a foreman for the Union Pacific Railroad, and he oversaw all the workers and He's the gentleman, along with his brother, that gave the term hell on wheels to the railroads. Not only with kind of the treatment of his workers, but the kinds of crowds that traveled along with the railroads, which were kind of rowdy, rambunctious, lots of prostitution, gambling, and other kinds of things came up with the railroad. Mm -hmm. So Jack Casement, um, he, uh, to just give a brief description of him, he's a gentleman who was a general in the Civil War. He wore uh, Russian attire um, and liked to, to refer to himself as the Cossack general. So was he Russian? No. <laughs> so, cool. and we have a depiction down at our station of him. And you can see in historical photographs, he has a whip in his hand and he was known for whipping his workers um, <laughs> to keep them on, on time and on task. This is the crew that they're working for. He's like I've never crazy. even heard of him. Well, if you've seen Hell on Wheels, Cullen Bohannon, that character, it's very loosely based on Jack Casement. But the real Jack Casement, I mean, he was wild. And he ruled over some really wild people. Jeez. I mean, I try to imagine, what was she seeing every day? Yeah. The, the wildest of the wild. <laughs> wow. Prostitution, gambling, drinking, saloons. So they had a, a good number of rowdy, rambunctious people. A lot of uh, immigrants who were working for the rails were theirs. And that historic photograph that Holly referred to, it's pretty famous. You can see Jack Casement standing there in his Russian attire, holding a whip. And behind him, you see the, the railroad cars stretching into the distance. And... That's actually one of his great inventions. He built these sort of boxcars. Hmm. And in the first few were all the tools for the workers. In the next few, he just jammed his workers in like sardines in um, bunk beds that were like three bunks high in each car. Wow. And there were no windows in those bunk cars. So um, you can actually see in the photograph that there are tents pitched on top of the cars that the workers would pitch themselves when it was too hot. And some of them would sling hammocks underneath the cars, like hanging over the tracks. <laughs> and I, I suppose that Mary and her mother, I mean, they weren't sleeping in the bunk beds with the men, so they must have pitched a tent. Now, I like cooking. Do you? Uh, yes. You, I love cooking. Really? When I want to cook. Yeah. I love cooking. Right. You don't do like the daily meal thing. I used to, but now it's like frozen Trader Joe's. And then a meal. Right. I'm more of like a every day. I enjoy it. I But I'm always cooking new things. Yeah. I hate routine, so it's always trying new stuff. Yeah. So... I, and I actually really like cooking over an open fire, and yeah. I love historical cooking, but imagining cooking every day for hundreds, thousands of hungry railroad workers on a train yeah. in the middle of dusty, hot nowhere, <laughs> probably not. Nope. Here's Sarah Singh. She remembered everything was cooked in a big um, soup kettle no matter what they were cooking. It was in this big soup kettle. And that the stove was on a separate railroad car at the very end um, of all the other railroad cars. Because of course they would have had railroad cars for the higher ups to live and sleep in. And uh, she wrote that everything, the work was hot and dusty and didn't pay much, which if you've ever been up towards Promontory, 
I can imagine in May it would be hot and dusty because there's nothing out there. Mm -hmm. Mary didn't describe anything, but luckily for us, a reporter from the New York Post visited the railroad crew and described their whole setup. It is half past five and time for the hands to be waked up. This is done by ringing a bell on the sleeping car until everyone turns out, and by giving the fellows under the car a smart kick, and by pelting the fellows in the tents on the top with bits of clay. In a very few short minutes, they are all out stretching and yawning. Another bell and they crowd in for breakfast. The table is lighted by hanging lamps, for it is yet hardly daylight. At intervals of about the yard are wooden buckets for coffee, great plates of bread, and platters of meat. There is no ceremony. Every man dips his cup into the buckets of coffee and sticks his own fork into whatever is nearest him. If a man has got enough and is through, he quietly puts one foot on the middle of the table and steps across. The workers of the Union Pacific that she worked for were mainly Irish immigrants and African Americans, many of whom were former slaves. Hmm. These workers, they worked 12-hour days, six days a week. But by the time Mary joined the team, they were racing to Ogden Hmm. and they were working around the clock. We're talking about very heavy kind of work that would take teams of five or six men to move small amounts of timber and iron and everything as they're hammering it in. And so when we talk to younger audiences today, we're talking about like laying a section of track is like laying are picking up 135 pickup trucks today. All that was because speed was really the goal. The Union Pacific was racing across America, trying to claim the most miles before their competitor, the Central Pacific. Mm. The Central Pacific was coming from the West Coast, racing (laughs) inland. um, And they had their own immigrant saga as well. Right. Their workforce was 90% Chinese, and these Chinese immigrants had come to America for the gold rush, but quickly discovered that the white miners were not going to allow them on the sites. So they took the job that they could get, which was for the railroad. So for every mile of track laid through certain parts of the territories, um, there was a government incentive to help pay so you get more money if you built through mountain passes so with central pacific they did 690 miles of track but union pacific did 1085 miles of track they got paid something like 35 to 45 thousand dollars per mile that was the government subsidy so it was not unusual for the railroad companies to take circuitous routes yeah. across America because the goal is to just lay down as many miles of track as they can. And for the workers, this is an intensely physically arduous job. On both sides, they sang work songs to keep up the rhythm of labor And thanks to the Library of Congress, we still have some of them. Hmm. Here is the famous Zora Neale Hurston singing one of the worker songs that she collected in the South. Rail weighs 900 pounds and the men have to take these lining bars and get it in shape to spike it down. And while they're doing that, while they have a chant that they use to the rhythm to wake it into place. And then the boss hollers, bring up my hammer gang and they start to spiking it down. A mobile on Alabama, a Fort Myers in Florida, a let's shake it, a let's break it, a let's shake it, a just a hair. And now let's pause for a word from our sponsor. Girls Can Crate is an awesome subscription box that introduces girls age 5 to 10 to real, fearless women who made the world better. Every crate features an inspiring woman, a 28-page activity book, plus everything you would need to complete two or three hands-on team activities and more. And if you're on a budget, they have mini crates too. Real women make the best heroes, and every month, Girls Can Crate delivers them. For What's Her Name podcast listeners, we have a special discount code for you. You'll get 20% off your first month's crate, any subscription that you order. 
girlscancrate, C-R-A-T-E dot com and use the code her name to get 20% off. This is L.M. Hilton in Ogden, Utah. I'm going to sing Echo Canyon. Mormon boys and men under the direction of Brigham Young who helped build the railroad into Utah in 1868 and 69 composed this song and it has been sung in Utah ever since. My grandparents taught it to me when I was a small boy, and I have sung it all my life. In the canyon of Echo, there's a railroad begun, and the Mormons are cutting and grading like fun. They say they'll stick to it until it's complete, for friends and relations they're longing to meet. Hooray, hurrah, the railroad's begun. Three cheers for our contractor, his name's Brigham Young. Hooray, hurrah, we're lighthearted and gay. Just the right kind of boys to build a railway. Our camp is united, we all labor hard, and if we are faithful, we'll gain our reward. Our leader is wise, and a great leader too, and all things he tells us we're right glad to do. Hooray, hurrah, the railroad's begun. Three cheers for our contractor, his name's Brigham Young. Hooray, hurrah, we're lighthearted and gay, just the right kind of boys to build a railway. Here's what's crazy. So Mary and her mother, they're working, I don't know, 12, 16 hour days. It's hard to say if they're cooking for people who are eating around the clock. Yeah. They were only allowed to eat the leftovers if there was anything left. So I don't know how many guys were working on a crew at a time. Probably talking about thousands of people. Thousands of people. You know, they're making their you know, they're working twelve hour days, so they're probably starving. You know, these women are cooking as much and as fast as they can, and then these poor women are left with whatever's left in the soup pot. You know, I would have loved to know, I wish she had written down her story, mm-hmm. you know, or somebody had talked to her, her family or something to get her story. Because I'm like, did they keep extra in the soup pot yeah. for themselves, knowing that right. yeah. they probably weren't going to get fed if they didn't? Uh-huh. Did her mom be like, here, you're young, go ahead, eat this, save some for me or, or something like that? Because I can imagine, I mean, I grew up with a bunch of brothers, so I can only imagine how much a bunch of hungry Irishmen would eat in a day. We tried to figure out what are they cooking. And she never said anything specifically about it, but we do know some things about railroad food. They actually had um, hunters that would go out and hunt for animals that were around. And so... There's a lot of hunting of buffalo. Yeah, buffalo. And and so you can imagine the food was probably a lot of, you know, rabbits and deer and that Mm. kind of stuff that they were cooking and whatever they could find Mm -hmm. along the route that they could use to eat. And the Union Pacific also had a large herd of cattle that was just coming up behind the railroad. Mm. So there's not actually an incentive for these two railroad companies to meet, because if they meet, then it's over, and Mm. there are no more miles to be laid and no more money to be made. So they are actually resisting meeting up with each other. Mm. And a lot of people also don't realize when they started, they just very much said, we're going to meet somewhere in the middle. The problem was is that um, before May 10th, 1869, they already passed each other. They were out in the middle of the desert just building their own things, and the <laughs> president that. and the government were like, uh, no, <laughs> we can't do that. Like, you have to decide on a point. And so then they were forced into deciding, and they had to undo a lot of their work, and focus it and get it back to promontory. And they were taught, you mean there's stories about even as they were passing each other, they were stealing each other's fill and railroad ties. But eventually, 
uh, the president himself, Ulysses S. Grant, forced them to meet. <laughs> and they set a place and they set a day. Promontory Summit, Utah Territory, May 8th, 1869. Newspapers across. But wait! Aha! Did you notice? <laughs> I just noticed something. What? <laughs> That's the wrong day! Yes! May 8th is the yeah. day they're supposed to meet. <laughs> and newspapers across America were notified. They're like, get ready, America. And they had this pretty impressive plan in place for the communication of the great moment to the world. Hmm. They have a telegraph line there. They're going to hook a telegraph line to the spike itself, the final spike that they're going to drive into the ground so that all telegraph operators across the world can hear the actual hammering of the spike. Wow. That's pretty awesome. It was going to be the world's first live broadcast <laughs> mass media event. <laughs> <laughs> The driving of the last spike of the Pacific Railroad. At the point where the ends of the rails will connect, the telegraph will be brought close. From this wire connection will be made with Salt Lake, Omaha, Chicago, St. Paul, St. Louis, New Orleans, Cincinnati, Memphis, Washington, New York, Boston, and all the large cities of the East, and with Virginia, Sacramento, and San Francisco. About 20 minutes before the time arrives for the driving of the last spike, the operator will commence a time signal and all over the continent will be heard the tick, 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 tick of the battery which will, as Superintendent Charles Crocker drives to place the last spike, echo the word, done. Done, the Pacific Railroad, the most gigantic enterprise of the 19th century. Completed, the iron band that binds New York and San Francisco in closer embrace, and which brings England and the Orient near together. So Thomas Durant, the Union Pacific Tycoon. He's headed for the event in his private train car. This is going to be his crowning achievement. <laughs> but May 8th came and went, <laughs> and Durant never arrived. <laughs> his workers stormed his train car and refused to let it move until he paid them what he owed them. Yes. <laughs> It was a strike. All of the workers took control of the moment That's and said, amazing. you can't go. <laughs> oh, good for them. I know. I love that. It puts the workers center stage in the saga. Yeah. We built this, big man, and we will not let you go until you pay us. <laughs> wow. And it's amazing to think Mary must have been there. Also, yeah. you know, she must have seen it go down. She she probably even witnessed it brewing as the men are planning this over their breakfast and dinner, you know. Surely she wanted to get paid also. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I I wonder was she in on all of this? Was she was she just watching it wide-eyed from her tent? Was she standing in the crowd? Hmm. I I wish we knew. Anyway, he paid his workers and got on his way. But by the time he got there, he was two days late. Uh. <laughs> so they're like, okay, reassemble the brass bands, get the newspaper reporters wow. back. Thomas Durant is here and we can have the ceremony now. <laughs> Let's do this. Promontory Point, Utah, May 10th, 1869. To General J.A. Rollins, Secretary of War. At 12 o'clock noon today, the last rail was laid at this point, 1,086 miles from the Missouri River and 690 miles from Sacramento. The great work commenced during the administration of Lincoln in the middle of the Great Rebellion is completed under that of Grant, who conquered the peace. G.M. Dodge, Chief Engineer. The other interesting thing about her, there's conflicting accounts when it comes to the Golden Spike ceremony. Hmm. One of the accounts I read said that she was actually the last person to drive the Golden Spike in, which I don't believe <laughs> for one tiny bit that out of all these dignitaries that were there, they let this little 12-year-old 
come in and hammer in the last, you know, the last hammer of the golden spike. I wish I knew where that story had come from, mm-hmm. um, whether it was sort of a family legend that they passed on and it, it got out there. Um, the other one, which is one I believe is far more credible, is that she wasn't even able to attend the Golden Spike ceremony. And that was because she was too busy cooking food oh. for the workers because after the ceremony, they were going to be hungry and needed lunch. Of course. I, I do I do like that image of, you know, all of these dignitaries and hardened railroad guys and this little 12-year-old yeah. sitting there. Yeah. <laughs> here, little girl. Yeah. Hammer, yeah. Going, here, you 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 do the honors of putting in the last last spike. So. With the driving of that final spike, a journey that once took four to six months was reduced to six days. Wow. It's such a game changer. It's crazy. And I really wonder what Mary and her mother made of it because they had taken the journey on foot. They had yeah. taken the four to six month journey and now there they are at the moment that the six months shrinks down to six days. Yeah. I feel like I'd be a little bit angry. You know? Oh yeah. If I had walked that long yeah. and then people just step off the train, you know, feeling pretty fresh after a six day journey, I'd right. be like, you don't understand. <laughs> Well, and also it, it's bringing the world into their little out of the world enclave now. Yeah. You ex- can no longer be this remote theocracy that people ignore. Right. They left the world behind and then the world came right to their front door. Yeah. If you want to ride, you got to ride like you're flying, but you take it at the station on the rock island line. And with that, the job was done. This was quite literally the end of the line. (laughs) The impossible had been achieved and nothing would ever be the same again. And the world took notice too. It wasn't just America. British newspapers were keenly aware of what it meant. On Thursday, May 10th at Promontory Point on the Salt Lake in the state of Utah, there was brought a successful termination of one of the greatest engineering works that has ever been accomplished in modern times. The last rail of the great highway from the Atlantic to the Pacific across the American continent was laid and a new road between Europe and India, China and Japan was formed. It is a work which has been carried out in the face of difficulties of no ordinary nature. No sooner had the American government and people laid down their arms employed in the greatest civil war which the world has ever witnessed than they set to work with undaunted energy to carry out this gigantic scheme of bridging over the vast continent and uniting two oceans by a continuous system of railway of 3,355 miles, or twice the length of the cable that crosses the Atlantic, over plains and deserts, over the ranges of the Sierra Nevada and the Rocky Mountains. It is a work of which the American people may feel proud, And it is one upon the completion of which we offer them our hearty and sincere congratulations. Well, every Monday morning, when the bluebird began to sing, you can hear those hammers a mile a mile, you can hear John Henry hammering, oh Lord, hear John Henry hammering. The workers... The immigrants and the the former slaves who built the thing, they just moved on. There was no more job. Mary and her mother, they went back to their farm, back to their Mormon enclave, where they would live out the rest of their lives in isolation from the rest of the world. So really, I mean, after that, she kind of disappears. Um, her mom remarries. Um, they end up living in Bear River City for the rest of their lives. Uh, she marries and stays there. But what's so interesting to me is that Mary Peterson Ibsen, she didn't seem to value her experience. In hindsight, even her own autobiography that she wrote for the DUP, she doesn't mention working for the railroad at all. She doesn't? She does not. 
What does she talk about? She talks about coming across the plains, Mm -hmm. getting married, and she doesn't talk about anything else. And I was kind of sad. It appears that her foray out into hell on wheels worldliness (laughs) wasn't something she wanted to talk about. And it wasn't something her people valued, Mm. which is just, wow. (laughs) Rora was not. I mean, can you, I mean... Especially at that time, she probably didn't want to be associated with that kind of a crowd. Well, if I was a 12-year-old in that camp, I don't know that I would particularly want to focus on it yeah. either. I mean, I don't know. I think it would be amazing. It has to have been traumatizing. And you think so? I, I mean, I think it would be amazing, but also scary. I mean, yeah. if, the, if you're one of just a few women in this camp, that's scary. Maybe. Yeah, maybe she just wanted to pretend it never happened. Mm. Never talk about it again. Fascinating. But if we zoom out, we see that women followed in her footsteps. In the coming decades, women came to work for the railroad in ever-increasing capacities. Eventually, they called them women of iron. Mm. And they were, you know, in full coveralls out there with wrenches and hammers, huge biceps, like doing the work, you know? Right. (laughs) And it provided them a wage that they couldn't get anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the women that I found were single mothers who needed this type of position in order to pay and take care of their children, kind of like Mary's mom. So trains and the technology that it represented kind of gave as the infrastructure of the of the West and the United States the idea of we can achieve anything that epitomizes kind of the American dream that we can work hard, earn more, and achieve our dreams. The Transcontinental Railroad is to me a saga of America's disenfranchised. On the sweeping stage of an entire continent, individuals who never had a chance before seized their moment. It, it seems like everyone involved were the underdogs, <clears throat> Indians being pushed off of their land by the unstoppable engine of progress, Irish immigrants driven reluctantly to America by famine at home, former slaves leaving behind the brutality of a post-war South, Chinese immigrants who left a war-torn country in search of a dream that was the gold rush, and Mormons who were mostly immigrants whose religious extremism was so unpopular that they had to move to the middle of nowhere. (laughs) These are the misfits who metaphorically and literally brought America together. Hmm. Golden Spike signified unity in 1869 and unity that came at a steep cost. Hmm. And 150 years later, that story is as relevant as ever. Special thanks to Sarah Singh and Holly Andrew for bringing us the story of Mary Peterson Ibsen. If you want to learn more about the Transcontinental Railroad, check out our website, whatshernamepodcast.com, where we have lots of additional resources for you, lesson plans, and even a test your railroad knowledge quiz. All the railroad music for this episode can be found at the Library of Congress. And we also featured Granite Creek, performed by Andy Reiner and John Souza. Our newsreels were read by James Henderson. Our theme song was composed and performed by Daniel Foster Smith, and Mark Nelson recorded the interview on site. 
We are so grateful to all of our sponsors. You can become one for as little as a buck a month to help make more episodes happen. Special shout out to Chantel Oliver, Kim Zielinski, and Rebecca Holland. Thanks for donating. Thanks for listening. Hi there. My name is Andy Reiner, and I host the River of Suck podcast. World-class musicians and scientists are my guests, and our conversations feature real talk about confidence, self-doubt, and struggles to stay positive in the face of impossible goals. The River of Suck is a super-wide mythical river churning with whitewater rapids, rocks, and thought piranhas. Bespoke musical soundscapes provide the backdrop for insightful discussions about life-changing strategies to combat negative thoughts. Give it a listen at riverofsuck.com. It's so good to be in the River of Suck. Thought.